chapter number 24. Uh, what we're going to do today is talk a little bit further about scaling. Um, last lecture, I kind of mentioned a little bit about why scaling is important and why scaling helps and how you can have some simple rules to predict what might happen four years down the road, six years down the road, eight years down the road, and so on and so forth. And why this has worked for a long time and might not work as well anymore today. That's an important thing. And then the rest of the lecture I'm going to talk about a little bit more, I'm going to come back to energy. We have talked about energy, you had a project part on energy, but it's still important, I think, to understand what can you do to reduce energy further. It's an important factor, it really plays a big role. Now, um, that's today's lecture. Um, we still haven't gotten around grading part phase two of the project. Uh, Ricky just got back from Australia. So uh, now that she's back, we'll basically be grading it and getting it done as soon as possible. And then um, on Friday, last lecture, before we have the project present presentation. So Friday, I'm going to talk about what you have to do for posters. So we're going to talk a little bit about wha what I expect uh, next Wednesday. Uh, that's one thing. Um, also, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about perspectives. What's going to happen with digital design in the years to come? Uh, what, uh, where is it evolving? What are the things, the challenges? What are the opportunities? And then finally, we're also going to have the class rating. It's important that, um, obviously, it's nice to have online type of thing and basically be able to watch the lectures from home or wherever you are. But I think class ratings are important. So I think I would uh, hope that you come up in large numbers on Friday. So that's uh, what we have uh, scheduled. So as I said, next Wednesday, same time, we're going to have poster sessions where we're going to talk about phase three of the project. And we'll post online what I expect, but I'm going to talk about this a bit on Friday. Uh, the, this will not be here, but will be held at the Wireless Research Center in downtown Berkeley. So we'll give you instructions where that's going to be. Uh, I'll also make up a little doodle poll where you can sign up for a slot. Uh, you get about I did the math, we have uh, 28 students, 30 students in the class, that's 15 groups of two. Uh, if you do 10 minutes, 12 minutes a, a piece, uh, with some questions included and things like that, we'll basically end up at about two hours and a half or something like that of poster time. So uh, I'll basically, you're gonna, I'll make a doodle where you can pick one slot. That basically uh, uh, would be the most, uh, uh, important thing. So I will ask you also to submit your posters in advance by electronic means to us before the poster session starts. It's going to be part of the grade as the electronic version of that. And um, what else would I say? Oh, yeah, slots. People kind of always, some people kind of try to push themselves towards the back because uh, we have more time. It won't make any difference because the posters will be submitted before so you don't get an extra hour or two hours if you kind of put yourself in the last slot. Actually, the only disadvantage is that me and the TAs might be a little bit more tired towards the end after hearing um, about it. So actually, I think it's always advantageous to basically put yourself up front, be one of the early ones. Yes? So if you're tired, you're not going to say, oh, it's an A, it's an A. Yeah, that's not the way it works. Uh, we might get grumpy. <laughs> you never know, right? No, it's, it, it doesn't make that much of a difference. But it, it's, it's a more engaging discussion towards the beginning because it's kind of new, and after a while it becomes kind of similar. Anyhow, but um, posters are your opportunity to sell. I'll talk about it on Friday. It's all about selling what you've done. So don't, um, don't show up with posters with very small fonts where you can't see anything. Show the highlights, the important things. Make sure they jump out. And then have the backup material. If I have a, qu a question, says, well, here's this, how we did that, and here's how we did that. OK? Already. Cool, so that's where we are at. Oops, that's. So let's go back to CMO scaling. Um, again, I mentioned that for so many years, um, semiconductor industry, at least in the digital world, has been driven by this concept of Denard scaling, um, which basically Bob Denard said in 74, you know, if you scale, with a factor of 0 0.7 every generation, your area goes down with a factor of two, that's cool. But at the same time, you're gonna scale the performance, your delay is gonna go down with the same factor, and your energy is gonna go down. And, and how much is gonna go down depends if you scale your supply voltage as well or not. Right? So, and so every two years approximately, we get this new generation pop-up, and it hasn't stopped. Um, again, today we're 22 nanometers as the front-end technology. 
we're already seeing the next generations being rolled out. And companies like Intel, for instance, are already working on the 12 nanometer generation. They're already kind of building little prototypes, device and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's, um, and, and I described how that scaling model basically works. It's kind of a, the ideal model says with G, we scale everything in the same way. If you scale all the dimensions and all the voltage simultaneously, the electrical fields remain the same, you basically get that kind of benefit that you're going to get your performance, your energy, and your area going down. In reality, that's not what we have always followed. In reality, the model that we have been using for scaling was somewhere in between. Right? For a long time, in the early days, we stuck to this model which is called fixed voltage scaling. So, well, we scale the dimensions, but it's nice to keep the voltage identical. 5 volt, 3.3 volts, it's a standard, it's easy to interface different components, and so on and so forth. However, net result was that power started to peak. Uh, that really hit in the early mid-90s. Suddenly people realized this is non-bearable anymore. We're going to have chips of 300 watt microprocessor chips, which you cannot cool. It's too expensive to put the cooling in there. You have a problem. So for a while then, we reverted back to full scaling. But that was not maintainable either, because there's one thing that doesn't scale very well. And I'll come back to that in a minute. It's the threshold voltage. Yeah, you would like to scale supply voltage and threshold voltage in the same way, but that doesn't work. Not anymore. So now we are going to something which we call general scaling, where you actually still scale dimensions, but the supply voltage don't scale as fast. Actually, over the last couple of years, they've been hovering around 0.8 to 1 volt. Not really going down anymore. Again, that's not maintainable because you will see that power starts picking up again. If you do that, then you basically keep scaling dimension, you will have a power problem. So again, there's a push to go back to full scaling. Uh, recently at the ICC conference uh, this year, Intel showed some processes running at 0.35 volt, 350 millivolt. They call it just above threshold operation. So again, it's a subtle balance, but it's an important one. So um, I've shown this. Now, the model I've been showing so far was for a long channel device. Now we all know long channel devices are hard to find these days. They're history. Most of the devices are fully velocity saturated unless we would really operate them in low voltages. But if you think about what's happening with the short channel device, we can do a very similar analysis. Um, if you think about, let's say, take the full scaling model, all the dimensions scale as 1 over s, the supply voltages and the threshold scale as 1 over s, then the area will scale as 1 over s squared. C ox is 1 over T ox will scale as s. Cl will do the same thing as before, nothing new. The load capacitance will scale as 1 over s. Right? That's what we expect. Scaling basically gives that a very nice capacitance scaling. Now, one <coughs> caveat. Right, this assumes that all your capacitance is beautifully scaling like the parallel plate capacitances, the gate capacitances, your diffusion caps, and all this type of thing. In reality, remember what I mentioned about these vertical gates? There's some parasitic capacitance that are not taken into account when you start building vertical structures. When you do a horizontal, it kind of comes nicely. But when you have these gates, they're kind of little towers. And you push them close to each other, capacitance from gate to gate starts playing a role. And that par parasitic capacitance might make that, or capacitance doesn't scale as nicely anymore as it used to be. Now, the only thing that changes really with a short channel model is ID. Because now, remember, ID is equal to VD. is not a quadratic function of the voltage anymore, but is a linear function. But also depends on um, W and L changes of little bit. So in overall, you can say that uh, W scales as 1 over S, C aux scales as S, so these things cancel. So we're going to see that current is going to scale as voltage. So really, these things cancel out. So the only thing we have really left is 1 over S. So we see that the current is scaling linearly with the technology. Now, what does that mean for R equivalent? Just as before, 
VDD scales down, current scales down, it remains constant. So we have a constant resistance for our device. Uh, your scale technology, your transistor, minimum size transistor will keep on having approximately the same resistance. Given the fact that the capacitance scales, we should still have our 1 over S performance scaling. Performance goes up as 1 over S, and that's really what you get. And if you look at uh, the power and the average power, it doesn't change that very much. So actually, what turns out that if you scale in the short channel regime, you will see that if you do the full scaling, it doesn't change that much from what you had a long channel device. It's only when you keep your supply voltage constant. Then you have a different factor because with velocity, remember velocity saturation, you don't get the quadratic factor anymore. It's a linear factor. So the, the penalty of not scaling the voltage as much is somewhat lower than you would have in the long channel devices. So that's one of the advantages in a way. Well, if you want to call it an advantage, it means that voltage doesn't do that much anymore as it used to do, bottom line. Okay, so this is the same thing, the same table. As I show you here is that um, um, if you look at power density in the full scaling for a velocity saturated device is one. It means I scale, my power density remains the same. If I don't scale the supply voltage, however, it goes up at S squared. Remember with long channel device it was S to the third. So it's not as bad, but still bad. So keeping the supply voltage constant for a long time is not a really good idea. Okay, so this is what has happened for a long time. Nowadays you can hear a lot of conferences and you hear keynote speaks, speakers and things like that, and they always say, well, the NART scaling is dead. It's not happening anymore. And there's a good reason for this. There's a good reason why they mentioned that. The main thing that causes our model that has been valid from the 1970s to the 2010s, 40 years of the NART scaling, what hasn't basically is not happening anymore is the following thing. There's some things that don't scale as technology. It's temperature. Temperature doesn't scale. It was not like I made my devices smaller that my temperature is going to go down. Unfortunately, temperature is a constant. So leakage, by the way, is a bipolar device. Bipolar device, you know that the current is a very strong function of the thermal voltage, KT over Q. KT over Q doesn't scale. K is the Boltzmann constant, that's a physics thing. Q is a charge of electron, physics. The only thing that's better is basically T, but T is a constant as well. So KT over Q, the thermal voltage is a constant, which means that uh, leakage is a big issue. If I keep on scaling supply voltage and I keep on scaling threshold voltages, my leakage becomes the dominant factor. And that's really the game we're in today. Leakage has become such a dominant part of the game that it actually in certain circumstances, if you don't have a circuit that switches all the time, leakage might dominate your power dissipation. So what we have done to prevent that is quite simple. It's well, we won't scale the supply, the threshold voltage. If leakage is a real issue, we shouldn't get too close to the threshold voltage, so we don't scale the threshold voltage. But now, as a result of that, VDD over VT, over the threshold voltage, is going down. While you, in the past we tried to maintain the ratio, we scale VDD, we scale VT, now we only scale VDD, you have a problem. Because you can right away see that it's going to reduce your current overdrive, and it's going to impact your performance. So that's the big challenge. Uh, so we have a problem here, and we are hitting cooling limits as a result of this. So what have people done? Well, one thing is, says, well, darn, too bad, we're not going to go faster anymore. And as you've seen, microprocessor speeds haven't gone up very much at all, the clock speed at least. It's been hovering around 3.3 gigahertz to 4 gigahertz, and that's where we're stuck at. The other thing that has happened is, uh, as I mentioned, leakage will have a different role if I have something that is very active, switches all the time, versus something that doesn't switch as often, right? So if you don't switch as often, you would like to have leakage to be as small as possible, because that's uh, by far the dominant factor. So if you have a mobile phone, 
if you have a low power device that you want to run for a long time, sensor nodes and things like that, there it is actually advantageous to keep your threshold higher. So what the technology folks have done is say, well, gee, instead of having one technology, if you now go to TSMC, ST, IBM, whatever, and you ask for a 28 nanometer process, they say, which one do you want? They have a number of processes in the store. Uh, one of them is called GP, general purpose. That's your run-of-the-mill high-performance process. Fairly low VTs, 0.3 volt approximately. Um, typically assumed to be for high-performance type of device like microprocessors. But then there's another process which is called LP, low power. And the low power process will come with a threshold that has 0.5, maybe even higher as a threshold voltage. So you can choose your threshold. And actually some fabs allow you, some runs, manufacturing runs, allow you to mix the two. Uh, it depends upon how you implant your devices and so on and so forth. It's going to be more expensive because I'm going to have some extra masks. But, and cr these are critical masks, by the way, the masks which are really expensive. But um, it allows you to say, well, I'm going to make a couple of devices. I'm going to make them high threshold devices and some other ones I'm going to make as, as low threshold devices. Okay? So that's an important trend. It's not going to go away quickly because that leakage problem is staying with us. Okay? Now, you may say, well, gee, how are we going to do our 20 nanometer type things then? And how are we going to do 50 nanometers? It's going to be all leakage. Um, what are you going to do against that? Well, a couple of things that people have are doing. And let me just show you that. Uh, let's go to a blank page. There we go. So what are people doing to get around that? Well, remember... The problem with leakage is the following thing. I have somewhere here VTH. And if you do this, this is log ID, and this is VGS. I get something like this, right? Flattens out. Well, this should be actually more flat. Let me erase that. Something like this. So the leakage current is the current that happens when VGS is equal to zero. So what could I do to alleviate this problem? One thing, obviously, is keep VTH large. The larger I make VTH, the less my leakage will become. Right? It's a logarithmic dependency. Anything you basically, if, every time, remember the, the curve, the, the slope factor? Anytime, if you have 80 millivolt per decade, if I Im improve, if I increase VTH with 80 millivolt, I get a reduction in factor 10 in leakage current. What else could I do? Not as a designer. As a designer, this is all you can play around with, right? Well, you can do other clever tricks, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Yes? So you mentioned this earlier, but um, maybe someone can make a transistor which has a speaker that has some That's right. So what you want to do is this. I would rather do something like this. That's hard. I don't know anybody has figured it out, except maybe when you use air. There's some transistors. Some work going on here in Berkeley on using switches instead of transistors. And if you have air, you open and close the switch, there's no leakage really. So in that case, you get a perfect switch. But now, um, what you would hope is to get it as close as possible to 60 millivolt per decade. Or if you're really cl clever and you come up with a totally new device, you might get below 60 millivolt per decade. B by the way, 60 millivolt per decade is an ideal bipolar transistor. So going to 60 millivolt per decade is done in the following way. What it really means is, if you look at a transistor, right, you get a very short channel, very thin type of, type of device. The amount of control that I have over what's happening in the channel is getting less and less. Because of this very thin structure, high doping levels and things like that, you lose control over the channel. So what can I do to get control back over the channel? Well, that's one of the ideas as well. Maybe if I wrap, I make the channel vertical. I make a little silicon strip. I make it vertical. And then I wrap my gate around it. 
So the gate is now around three corners of your channel. The channel is kind of a sliver of silicon, and I put the channel around it on three directions. Okay? So it means that now I can control the electrical field from three directions, which gives me better channel control. Typical will give you better sub-threshold or, or, or ch ch short channel effects, and will give you a steeper, you have a more capacitive coupling into the channel, you get you a steeper top of slope. This device was invented in Berkeley in 1998. It's called the FinFET. FinFET because you now build transistors as a fin and you wrap things around. This is 3D now. This is not anymore your traditional flat type of silicon. I etch things and I put layers down. Now you have now to build shapes in a three-dimensional format. Now, other companies gave this another name. It's also known as a trigate. And that's really what, what Intel introduced in their 22 nanometer node. There was a big splash. Suddenly, it was the first time that a company went away completely from a 2D process to a 3D process structure. And that's what we're down doing now. Um, let's say at 22 nanometers. There's other approaches, um, something which is called FDSOI. I'm not going to talk more about that, but a similar concept. Better control over the channel. The ultimate would be to, if I have a channel, I have a transistor like this, and I put a gate all around, that would be my gate. Wrapping around the channel. Now, that's hard to do. It's non-trivial how we do that. Well, what I could do, for instance, is something like this. I build silicon, and then I build little towers around it. And then I put my gates around this whole thing as a cylinder. And then make connectivity on the top. This is what's being done with carbon nanotubes. It's another way. Better control over the channel. Channel wraps all around the transistor. Better subthreshold behavior. So there are just some examples. Now, one last thing that I want to mention is that there's another thing that's going on today, which is called thin fat. Uh, sorry, uh, T-FET, tunnel FETs. Tunnel FETs are a new type of transistor which are based not on diffusion as we have in our current transistors as a transport mechanism, but as tunneling of, of uh, electrons through energy gaps. So it's a tunneling-based device. And there, maybe we can get to about 40 millivolt per decade. So better subthreshold behavior. So bottom line is, People are really hard at work to basically address that leakage problem. But it's going to take a while because those things are expensive. They don't come for free. It's a new process flow. It changes the way you do things. All right. Let's go back to this issue. The other thing that I wanted to point out is this thresholds are one. The other problem one is very important is that process variation is becoming more and more important. If I make things smaller, any variation will become more and more uh, of high impact. For instance, if I have a supply voltage of 5 volt and my threshold, which is half a volt changed by 50 millivolt, doesn't do very much. If my threshold is at 300 millivolt and my supply voltage is 300 millivolt, a small voltage change in the threshold is going to have a huge impact on your delay, on your energy, and so on and so forth. So variations are becoming more and more important. We have to think about how to design around those. Okay, so that's kind of the important thing. But here's kind of a projection. This is from um, Intel of last year's or so. This 45 nanometer, how technology, how they see technology evolve over the years to come and what's going to happen in the next couple of years. So 2012, 22 nanometers. Um, transistor density, what they predict is that transistor density will keep on increasing 70% from generation to generation. I, that's the number we've been working with. That's what I show here. So 2014, we're going to see um, 16 nanometers, 2016, 11 nanometers, 8 nanometers, 5 nanometers by 2020. That's scary. It's eight years from now. A bunch of questions still to be remain to be answered before we even can go there. And nobody knows how to make a 5 nanometer transistor today. Nobody know, even knows if you can make one. 8 nanometers, yeah. Can you make it economically? We don't know. 
So it's going to be an interesting eight years. Um, what you see is that frequency scaling, as I mentioned, is slowing down substantially. It is amazing that they still predict that we'll see some improvement in frequency. VDD scaling, yes, but slowing down as well. Right? So the mention of capacitance, they hope they will keep on scaling capacitance the same way. I am somewhat skeptical about that. I don't believe that's true. And the leakage factor is one times optimistic to 1.43 pessimistic. So it's kind of an idea of how companies like Intel are planning what they're going to do for the next generation. So, okay, here we are. This is a chip, 45 nanometer core, local memory. This is what we get, um, 6 millimeter square, 2.5 gigahertz, 7 gigaflops, 1.2 watt. Well, what happens if I scale this down to, um, I think what technology node would this be, 8 nanometers? You get basically the whole thing shrinks down to 0 0.34 millimeter square. Think about it, right? The process which is right now, 6 millimeter square becomes basically a little fraction. So it says, okay, I can put 100 of them. No worries. Or you can put a lot more processors down. Um, somewhat higher speed. Each of those processors, these little tiny guys, is going to give you 9.2 gigaflops. And they hope that the power will go down this way. Not really sure it will happen that way. So that's kind of the challenge which is out there. But that's kind of the interesting part of this Denard scaling model, right? Is that you can start doing this homework exercises, okay? It means that if I'm at that technology node, I should be able to put so many processes on the die. Uh, this is the performance I might get. This is the power. What should we do from a design perspective to address some of the challenges that arise? So you can look forward, which is very rare. It's not in all technologies that you can do this. Yes? Uh, gigaflops. Gigaflops. Uh, how many floating point operations can I perform per second? Yes, that is correct. Giga is 10 to the 9th. Now, this is small because here's where we are. Actually, this kind of addresses this a little bit. This is performance roadmap. Um, so, megaflops, gigaflops, teraflops, petaflops, exaflops. Um, now you can see that this is for high performance computing. Super, machine, super computers, the craze of the world, those type of things that the Department of Defense uses to simulate big things or that you use to predict the weather for the next year or so, this kind of things. That's what the type of computers they're using. So in 2010, we are basically sitting between the petaflop to the exaflop type of, uh, type of regime. Um, now, laptops and handhelds, or basically client machines, these are basically desktops, always follow about one generation behind, 10 years behind approximately. So you might predict that by the year 2020, our desktop devices, like your game machines or things like that, will be able to do about a, a petaflop type of computational power. That's a lot. It means that the amount of power that you can get in a small device is just incredible. Now, can you imagine that you have that in your mobile? That you have a supercomputer sitting in your mobile? That would be about a year 2030, approximately. So you have to wait a little bit for that. But it's amazing how, if you keep, this thing keeps going, how much performance you will get. And the question is, how do you use that performance? What are you going to use it for? These kind of questions are very interesting to think about. I'm going to skip over that. Now, there's one thing in the scaling model that I've been talking about so far. I've uh, been talking only about transistors, which is a little bit naive. Because as we know, transistors are important, but if you connect them together, there's some other factors that play a game and, and play a role as well, and that might not scale as nicely. So it's wires. And when you hear many people talk about the next generation exaflop or what is it, uh, exa, beta, exa, there's atoflops too. Right? There's the next generation after that. Uh, and then you run out of names. There's nothing above uh, ATA, I think. I believe that's, the, that's it. So you have to come up with new acronyms after that. But anyhow, um, the biggest challenge is not going to be the transition, what people predict, but it's going to be the interconnect. How do you get the data back in and out at enough speed, the data movement part? And it's partially because wires scale a very different way than transistors. 
Uh, we walked through some of that already, but I just want to repeat this for a second here. You look at capacitance. Assume that we have only parallel plate capacitance, right, for a second here. Then we know that the capacitance will scale as WL times over T ox, right? And if you look at that, it's going to be 1 over S, right? T ox is 1 over S, W and L all are 1 over S. So capacitance scales as a technology, as we already discussed. Now, the resistance of the wire is proportional to the length of the wire over WH. Now, here and here, I assume that L scales as 1 over S. Means the length of the wire scales as a technology. That's not necessarily the case. There's always wires that are going to be longer and don't scale in the same way. So long wires don't follow this. If, for instance, L is constant, then you don't get 1 over S, you actually get 1. Right? Your capacitance doesn't scale if the wire length for the longer wires remains constant, which is probably the case because if our chips remain the same size, then there's always going to be wires at about the size of the chip, and they don't scale. The local wires will scale, right? Between gate to gate, that will go down, but the ones that basically are for your buses and interconnect between larger blocks, not going to scale. So let's look at the resistance and see what happens there. So the resistance, if we would have full scaling, rho is constant. Let's assume that the rho doesn't change. You use copper or whatever material it is. So we see that the resistance actually goes up as S. Because the cross-section, W times H, is 1 over S squared, goes down. The length of the wire goes down. So overall, you look at an increase in resistance if I scale all dimensions of the wires in the same way. If I scale the cross-section, the resistance goes up as R squared. If I scale the length, then obviously my overall resistance is S. So which means that your propagation delay is a product of 2 is a constant. So even though our transistors get faster, our local wires don't. That's a problem. Right? So um, longer wires, on the other hand, are even worse because this scales as S squared. The product of the 2 is that the propagation delay of long wires is exactly going to go up at S squared. So that's a big challenge. What do you do with long wires? A couple of things we've done around that, which, as I mentioned earlier, technology scaling guys says we cannot let this happen. That doesn't make any sense. Wires should scale, sh short wires should scale as a technology, as your transistors. So otherwise, I make my transistor faster, but my wires don't get faster. That's no good. So what did we do? We kept H as a constant. That the height of the wires wasn't shrinking. We made them more and more vertical, which now says that instead of S, I get 1 here, and this becomes 1 over S. And beautifully, our wires are getting S speeding up in the same way as our transistors do. Um, this is also good for your long wires, obviously. Instead of S squared, you get S. Okay? So, interesting and big challenge here. So, you can do certain things about this. You can have thicker wires for long wires. You can do all kinds of things, as we discussed. More metal layers, no interconnect materials. But still, remember, this is a big problem. A problem that a lot of people fret about continuously is what to do about those long wires. And even the shorter wires are becoming an issue because if I might make my wires more like this, then fringing capacitance starts coming to the game. That adds capacitance. Wire-to-wire -wire capacitance becomes more and more important. All those things we talked about. So be aware that even though we talk about the scaling model, we always talk about transistors, don't forget wires. Wires are becoming more and more important in the design process. And it's something that you have to think about and plan. Like if you do your, your project, even in the layout, you have to think about well, how can I structure in such a way that my wire length remains short? Because that's going to impact my energy, it's going to impact my performance. Okay? All right. Any questions on scaling? Any questions you might have of what happened in the future? Well, we'll talk more about that on Friday, if you talk about the future. I kind of gave you some illusions already, but um, we'll talk more about this on Friday. A couple more things I wanted to say about energy and power. Um, topic that's really important these days, right? Um, if I have a cell phone, what you're going to do with your cell phone is going to be determined by 
your battery power. I have a certain battery size. So if you want to get more stuff done in your cell phone and you will just still run it off a, you don't want to recharge your cell phone in the middle of the day, you're going to have to make your energy efficiency better and better and better, even though people ask for more performance all the time. Right? If you look at the next generation smartphones, tablets, you always want to get better performance, better graphics, all this kind of cool stuff you want to see. So making device energy efficient is going to be very important. Now, two things, dynamic power, static power. What do you do? How can we basically keep on scaling dynamic power down and what can we do about it? So this equation you know now, it says power, average power is CLVDD squared times F. Right? No surprise there. But um, so what can I do to reduce this? Well, if I want to reduce this, I can either work on this, this, or this. There's three factors I can play around it, right? Frequency, yes, that's a factor. If I don't want to get my power going too high, I'm not going to clock it faster. But then I say, hey, wait a second. If I don't clock it faster, how do I get more performance? Right, the, the trick in the past was you want to get your next generation device, you speed it up and you increase your clock frequency and bingo, I get a factor 1 over 0 0.7 increase in clock frequency. That's really cool. Right? It was easy. But nowadays, that clock frequency is frozen. How do I get more performance? How come we basically, every time you get your new tablet out there, it's faster? Even though my clock frequency hasn't changed substantially. That's one thing to think about. I'll talk about that in a minute. Scaling supply voltage is the other option. But remember, if I scale down supply voltage, uh, you have to be careful because scaling down supply voltage might impact your performance. Again, it might decrease your clock frequency. So that's another factor. And then your overall what we call switching capacity or switching capacitance. Switching capacitance <laughs> is the amount of capacitance I have on the die that's why that switches around how much of my capacitance switches every clock cycle. Right? If I reduce alpha, my power is going to go down. And this is something that has happened, actually. Um, you might have heard about dark fiber, fiber, optical fiber that's not used. There's also a talk about dark silicon, silicon that doesn't switch. One way to keep the power down on a big microprocessor chip is, well, I'm not going to switch it often. That kind of seems counter-natural. So what I've done for quite a while is say, what we do is, obviously the processor core is important, we're gonna switch that a lot. But there's a lot of other things in the processor that don't switch as often, like cache memory. So if I put more and more cache memory on the die, that cache memory doesn't switch as often. Right? It's only when you have a cache miss, you put a load a new chunk in there, but most of the cache is pretty quiet. So putting more memory on the die is a way for you to increase performance to a certain extent because more cash typically gives you better performance and doesn't cost you power. So that's another thing that people have been playing around, but at some point in time, you say, well, that's kind of in the extreme is ridiculous, right? You have a whole bunch of memory. There's nothing switching anymore. You don't do anything either. So, but again, so that's a, a very uh, subtle uh, thing. Um, there's a bunch of things I can do to affect tr um, transition activity. Right? We talked about some of the lower level things you can think about, like NOR versus XOR or NOR versus NAND. If I use basically a dynamic logic style, then NAND seems to be the better choice. If I use a static one, it depends on what logic function you're going to use will determine how much switching activity I have. Static versus dynamic is another option. Dynamic switches more than static. How often I make things flip around is something I play around with. Let me give you a very simple example. Um, if I have a, um, um, say I take a block, and I, let's say this is a multiplier. I have a multiplier sitting there. And I have um, a stream of data in there coming in. Could be, let's say, video. A video stream comes into the multiplier, you basically process it. Um, what you know about a video stream is that subsequent samples very often are going to be quite similar. 
right? You don't have, um, your data is not going to change randomly. There's some pattern in it. If I have a, a data stream coming in, like a sinusoid or something like that, you will have from sample to sample, there will be some relationship. Not all bits are, bits are going to flip back and forward. As a result of that, the activity and multiplier might be not, uh, might be restricted. Now, if I would instead apply random data, cycle after cycle after cycle, your power is going to go up, right? Because every time I apply a complete new data word, all the bits are going to flip around. I get a lot of activity. Now, current day micro microprocessors, a lot of the way microprocessors used to be designed was basically the trick was to randomize data as much as possible. What do you have? You have an instruction stream, you multiplex, you put your multiplier on the bus, and they say, okay, I'm now going to do that, now I'm going to do that. So the data coming over the bus was purely random, and what's going in your multiplier, one after the other one, was very often randomized. You maximize power. On the other hand, if I still build a dedicated unit that does nothing else than processing that data stream without using buses, basically direct connection between memory and your multiplier, you will preserve some of that correlation between the data, you have less switching activity. So these are games you can play as a designer. Think about how can I make or reduce the amount of switchings I'm going to have. Anyhow, these are just some examples. I'm, I'm going to jump over this because I want to go to something that's a, a little bit more kind of interesting, I believe, in the longer parts of things. These are in the slides, so don't worry about this. So, um, so but Mike, let me go to the key rules. Key rules of low power design is number one, don't waste. Really, um, it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Most of the chips still waste a lot of energy. Um, if you don't need to switch the capacitors, don't do it. Right? For instance, as we talked about the fact that in the past, the clock was going to all registers all the time, even if the registers were not used. The clock was going up and down and up and down. There's a whole bunch of capacitance that switches back and forth. So if that block is not used, disconnect it from the clock network. Reduce the amount of capacitance that switches. Um, and there's a couple of things that, the other one that basically is kind of, doesn't sound obvious, but don't run things faster than you need to. Because running something fast is expensive. You have to run it at high voltage, right? If you want to basically the maximum speed, I'm going to have my maximum voltage, maximum energy. Very often, if I'm sitting here and some things I want to see fast, like I have my computer, something I want to see fast reaction, anything that's user interface, but other things that I throw in the background, I don't care how fast they go. If they go a little bit slower, that's okay. That gives you tremendous opportunity to increase power or to decrease power, sir. Uh, this is true for instance for single processing. A lot of things like I would, I watch video. I want to watch video or listen to audio. I want to have an MP3 player. It doesn't make sense for my MP3 player to be faster than what I can hear. Right, if I increase my samples too fast or I, I do generate the data too fast, I'm just going to waste energy. Rather than slow down your computation, make sure that you're just ready in time to get your, the next data word to you. So just fast enough is very important for a lot of applications you have to do with user interfaces. Don't be macho, but basically think about what can I do to minimize energy. And then the last one may count as a shock, but it's true. Exactly, all those programmable processors are total wastes. Right. If you think about it, we are so used now to this model where you have a microprocessor to do. So it's nice, it's very general purpose, I can do anything on it, right? A microprocessor, you program, it's a Von Neumann machine, you have an instruction stream, you can do whatever you want to. Very flexible. But be aware, flexibility comes at a cost. Suppose I built, like you do in class here, you built a very dedicated circuit to do Whatever, right? Um, let's think about your neural processor or whatever it is. I build a dedicated processor, very dedicated to it. Every gate is optimized, bingo, 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 all done. Really nice, low energy. If I put this now on one of those Intel super duper microprocessors and I compare 
for exactly the same function, the same performance, and compare the energy numbers. How much energy do I consume in one or the other one to compute my function? What do you think the difference would be? Any guess? Factor two? 10? 100? Well, that's your problem. <laughs> no, actually, try it out, though. Okay. Try it out. Put it on your Intel process and compare with what you've come out with. Okay. And, and you will see that, actually, just turning that Intel processor on is not gonna, it's gonna take you more than a milliwatt. Okay. I can guarantee you that. So, because you have to fetch instructions from large memory, they have to go over buses, you have to decode them, you have to turn that data pod on, you have to take the data back into the memory, da 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 so think about it, 10, 100, 1,000? Who thinks about less than 10? 100, 100. Who thinks 1,000? Okay, who thinks 10,000? It's actually around the factor 1,000. It's three orders of magnitude. The difference between dedicated hardware versus the extreme which is a complete general purpose processor. And it's because of all the overhead that comes with it. And then you add software to it, and software adds some other layers of inefficiency on it. And software programs are using libraries and all the kind of, and you have no clue anymore what's going on below that. So layers, software layers might add other layers of inefficiency on top of what you're basically doing. So be aware there's a straight off between general purpose and dedicated. Okay, so let's do it. Now let's assume that we do a good job at this, all of this. What else can we do to improve performance? What have microprocessor vendors done over the last couple of years to increase performance while keeping energy at bay or even reducing energy? What's the big buzzword these days? Sorry? Sorry? Parallel processing, indeed. They use parallel processing. Now, you might ask yourself, wait a second here, why does it help me? Right. Why does parallel processing help? Well, actually, the answer is quite simple. Um, let's go to an example here. Oh, oh, I, I, I hesitate to not show this because I think this is really too cool. This is the first, um, I might have shown this already, or not, but this actually, remember this wasting, not wasting power? This is an example of how people didn't even bother to, this is the first Pentium processor, was 1990. And you look here at the power dissipation of the process, the big black line, for different functions. Like, this is still 1990, we're not talking Windows, we're talking DOS. Booting DOS, and then running some applications like Excel on it, and so on and so forth. Now, what you observe here is that the maximum power dissipation was happening when the process was doing nothing. Just executing a stream of knobs, new operations. The power actually maximized out. What they did is they didn't care. So when those knobs were to all those blocks were flipping back and forth doing random data executions. Uh, then it was a lot of stuff going on, but it was all random, which is, as I said, already said, is the maximum of the power you get. So uh, they figured that one out later. So this 15 watts. So Pentium 2, this is, wait a second here, we have a problem. So they learned to turn things off when they don't use them. And so suddenly, instead of having peak performance, they went the opposite way. And you can see now that when you don't do anything, your power basically plateaus out at the bottom. But it showed that people didn't care about waste. They didn't, it didn't matter. No designer was ever thinking about this. And very often, a very small change can make a huge impact in what you save. Okay, so we'll come to the parallelism in a minute, but let me first kind of give you one guideline, right? Um, something we already discussed before. If you look at metrics, Every design that you're going to basically analyze, you never can judge it purely on performance, you never can judge it purely on energy, you always have to judge it into the energy performance space. Right? And typically what you start up is that um, all your designs can be plotted in your 2D plane and, and typically you will end up with a whole bunch of plots. Yeah, you do some optimization, you get another thing. Now we know that if you do the optimal job, the best possible job, let's say for a given performance, there's going to be an optimal energy point. 
and get it better than that is, a, is going to be very hard or you have to change devices, technology or something like that. So for any block, we can actually draw out this optimal energy performance equation or space. This is the Pareto optimal curve. And but doing better than that is impossible. So typical design process, what you should do is you start up with, let's say, a given first design that fits somewhere in your space. And you're going to be off that Pareto optimal curve. And then what you do is zigzag kind of to a optimal point that basically says, what is my performance I need? And for that performance, what's the minimum energy I can get? So that's your typical optimization process, is basically starting with somewhere in your space and then doing a set of transformations. Ultimately, you hope you can get on this optimal curve. The second thing is that when you look at those curves, they always look like the same thing. Any Pareto optimal curve looks like this. And it has very flat ends, which means that if I really want to go at very high performance, I'm going to pay a lot in terms of energy. If I want to go to very low energy, I'm going to pay dearly in performance. So this is always an area of diminishing returns. You can do a lot of work to get a little bit more performance, but it's going to cost you a lot of energy when you operate in that space. And the same happens on the other side. Okay? So a lot of diminishing returns is something you have to remember. If you see it, you do a couple of more iterations and you don't get very much anymore, please stop. Sometimes actually it's a good idea to back off a little bit. Okay. So um, this is a very useful mechanism. If I know where my parallel optimal curves are, then I can start doing fair comparisons. Say, so I want to do a design and I need an adder. As you know now, there's about 10 different, 20, 100 different implementations of that adder. I could use uh, select, I can use carry look ahead, I can use carry bypass, I could use ripple. Which one is better? Which is the better adder? I, and the, my answer is that I don't know. But if I know for each of those adder, what, given the technology and implementation, what that Pareto optimal curve is, by varying the transistor widths, changing the supply voltages, threshold voltage, and all this kind of thing, I get, let's say, this is adder one, and this is adder two, I can do a fair comparison because we know there's somewhere a break point between the two. If you go in performance regions that are higher than this, I might use adder two. In the other case, I'm going to use adder one. So I can basically make a clear decision which one is better for what performance type of and energy type of region. So that's very important. That break points, if you know those break points, you can make start making informed decisions. Otherwise, you're just guessing. And we do this too often. Um, I think this design is pretty good. It feels good. But you don't know. Right? So be, be aware of that. And then design in the energy delay space is just manipulating that energy delay curve. For instance, when I, I remove waste, what I'm just doing is making my curve going to the left. If this is delay, this is energy. If I remove inefficiencies, I get a better curve. That's always better. If I use alternative topologies, I choose between topology one and topology two. That's another thing I could do. I, if I say, if here's my adder one, here's my adder two, I can make a good informed decision. Then um, very often you might have discrete choices. Right? I have four processes in my library. Which one should I pick? Well, you're going to basically look at your energy delay curve and see where they fit in the overall space and how close do they get to the Pareto optimal curve. Like, for instance, if I have a plot like this here, would well, you know right away if I use this processor, it's inferior in all possible means. This is something I should never use because if there's a process that's better in this way and a process that's better in this way, then this is basically a wasteful type of solution. And it happens quite often that people start basically working in this space for one reason or another, but they're working with inferior solution. But the bottom line is, what I want to point out is, anytime you do optimization, try to put yourself in that energy delay optimization space. It really helps a lot. And fortunately, there's some tools around these days that can help you to plot those, figure out where those Pareto optimal curves are automatically. So you take a design and say, 
take my parameters, which is my transistor sizing, my voltages, whatever it is, throw it in there, and out of this comes your Pareto optimal curve. You know where you're going to be. You take another design, you get another one of those curves, you can figure out where the optimal designs are going to be. So that's very useful and very interesting things to be known about. So let's talk about this parallelism thing. It's one of those things that really has changed. It's basically used, right? think about parallelism, it's a way for me to manipulate my curves. It says I have two versions, and one of them is going to be better in one region versus another one. So let me give you an example here. Uh, let's explain you the concept of why parallelism is a good idea from a power perspective, um, the, and, and, and why it's basically so much in vogue today. Let's take a very simple example. Suppose I have a simple function I want to execute. Let's say this is, could be two adders, right? Adder one, adder two, F1, F2, two registers, and we're going to clock it at a certain frequency, F ref. So the registers get clocked at F ref. Let's assume that those are edge triggered flip-flops, and you have two functions, F1 and F2, right? Um, I can compute the power dissipated by this device by, I know F ref, I know the clock frequency, I know what C ref is, this is the average switching capacitance. If I put some vectors to it, I can estimate what C ref is, and I will know VDD. So my power is VDD squared times C ref times F ref. Now, let's try to figure out, I want to basically reduce the power. Um, what could I do? What's the best way for me to reduce the power of this particular circuit while maintaining the performance? I don't want to give up on performance. I want to get the same clock frequency or the same throughput, but I want to reduce power. Well, let's look at this alternative. I'm going to double my functions. I'm just going to use more area. Right? This is double the function. I'm going to put two times the same thing down. So we have block one block two, same register, I have multiple registers, and then what I'm gonna do is use them in parallel. So you have one data word coming in, the data stream comes in, the first data word I'm sending here, the second one I'm sending here. So I kind of interleave between the two blocks. So I have your data coming in, send to block one, block two, block one, block two. And then I use a multiplexer at the end to basically stream them back together, right? For the same performance, what I can do now is reduce my clock frequency, right? If I want to get the same throughput, I can clock this thing at half the speed, right? Because I now have two blocks working in parallel, I can run the, two, the whole block at F ref over two, okay? So that's kind of cool, but you say, wait a second, that didn't help me anything because I doubled the capacitance. Right? If you look at this block, the capacitance, switching capacitance has doubled. I have the clock frequency, and I doubled the capacitance. So it seems like it's a wash. Actually, it would be worse than a wash because I added some overhead. I added a multiplexer. And multiplexer is gonna consume power as well. So what makes the saving grace of this? What is it making the difference? Well, you say, hey, wait a second. There's something I realize. This blocks F1 and F2 now are running at half the clock frequency, which means I can make them slower. Making slower means reducing the supply voltage. I can, for the same performance, if I know I've only need to meet my critical path can be twice as large, or I can reduce my supply voltage. And that's where the big gain comes from, because now my parallel voltage is a certain fraction of the original voltage. But remember, remember one thing, is that voltage is quadratic. That's the big thing. So if you look at my power of my parallel implementation, it's going to be equal to P ref times your capacity. The frequency is, they cancel out, right? It's basically factor two. So frequency um, is F ref over two. That's the frequency. This is my capacitance. So you can see that this factor goes up a little bit because of the overhead. But the key thing is here is this epsilon par squared means that we scale down our supply voltage with a factor epsilon, and that's squared. So parallelism, assume now that 
very simplistically that to get the speed down by a factor of two that I can reduce the supply voltage by a factor of two. Right? This is not really true. That's a linear dependency. We don't have a linear dependency. But in that case, it means that basically putting things, two things in parallel reduces my power dissipation by a factor of four. That's amazing. And obviously, it's going to cost you some because it costs you area. I'm basically going to make my chip bigger. But the argumentation is, hey, we're scaling technology anyhow. We get more and more transistors. Area is not as big a deal anymore. And by the way, and we'll come back to that, there's some arguments that show. So the bottom line here is that what you get, if you don't do it exactly, you do a little bit more precise thing. This is for 90 nanometers. Um, you look at um, the overhead, if you basically do parallel, two blocks in parallel, you see that your power goes down with a factor two. Not a factor four, but a factor two approximately. If you do blo four blocks in parallel, my power is only one quarter. Right? All for the same performance. This is really cool. Right? It basically says I want to get my power down, I just keep on more, adding more and more parallelism. And that's obviously a beautiful thing. It was invented in, that was discovered in the early 1990s. Now it took microprocessor vendors about 10 years to kind of get convinced that was useful for them as well. And it's only around the year 2002 when Intel hit the brick wall in power with one of their processor generations and said, oh my goodness, what are we going to do now? They said, oh, we found it. We're going to do, put two processors on the die. And now quad cores, four processors on the die, and so on and so forth. So that's what's happening. Now, what prevents us putting a, a factor 100 processors on the chip? Would that my, my power goes to asymptotically to zero? Static power supply. Static power but even that, let's ignore that for the time being. You, you're right. Obviously, if I put 100 processors and it goes run very slow, leakage becomes a larger and larger fraction, right? Leakage might be approximately proportional to the supply, to basically the area. The more area I have, the more leakage I will get approximately, right? So what prevents me from scaling down, well, basically going to 100 process, 1,000 processors? Power should be zero. Supply voltage. Supply voltage. You, you, can, you can keep going down. That's right. So remember, once I get, I, I reduce my supply voltage, I, the closer I get to the threshold, suddenly your speed of your processors is going to drop like crazy. You go below the threshold, you have an exponential dependency between performance and supply voltage. So if you just drop your supply voltage a little bit, I'm going to need a lot more processors to compensate for that loss. And at some point in time, the overhead will just dominate. It's all the overhead of basically the wiring and all the kind of things becomes a dominant factor. And in the end, you start losing. Actually, your power is going to go up again. And that's exactly what we notice. Now, that's one approach. Another approach uh, to basically go after high performance is pa pa parallelism is one. Another option is to use something that we have discussed early in the class is, is using pipelining. Pipelining is a somewhat different concept. It's also parallel, it's also concurrency, but it's in a different way. So suppose I take my blocks F1 and F2. Rather than basically putting them in sequence now, I'm going to put some registers in between. Right? And I'm going to clock them all at the same clock frequency. <coughs> so what's happening now? In the pipeline structure, I have, we haven't discussed that in a lot of detail, but let me just kind of show you the concept of pipelining for a second here. Let's go back. Get this here. Explain a little bit about pipelining. Suppose I have a data path that has a couple of blocks in sequence. Let's, let's make it very simple. Let's make it all adders. So I have a register here. My clock period is going to be determined by the delay to those three adders. I, it's simplistic assume that we just add each of those in very simplistically says, my delay is going to be three adders, right? Not really true, you know, that critical path can follow bizarre kind of uh, contoured type of path, but let's not worry about that right now. So my register. Now what I could do to speed this thing up is to put a register here plus a register here plus. 
and connect them all. I still can clock them at the same frequency, right? I still have the same frequency, but what's happening with the throughput here? Here, the problem with this circuit is if I apply an input word, it first goes to this block, the other two are idle, then it goes to the next block, this one is idle, this one is basically doing functions, the other two are idle, and then it moves to the third block, and the first two are idle. If you make a very deep logic structure, the overall utilization of your hardware is quite low. Right? There's only one adder working at a time, and the other one is just sitting there. If, on the other hand, I put registers in between, what's going to happen is that I take my first word in and I put in this adder. Okay, the result comes in, goes to this register. Next clock cycle, I take a new input word in. It's going here. The previous one moves to the next adder. As you can see, what's happening now is that each adder is running, we're running concurrently. We're actually working on three data words at the same time. This is what's called a pipeline, like you do in a automobile plan, right? When you have an assembly plan of automobiles, you don't have a row of people standing there and you have one part coming in and everybody's sitting there waiting till a part arrives and then they're going to do something and they pass it on and, and, and take a rest again. That's not what you do. No, everybody takes a part and you keep moving the part and the next parts come in. You do all those type of things simultaneously. That's why I call it a pipeline. So the advantage of a pipeline is that you get three times more throughput. The delay is, is larger because it's now going to take me three clock cycles to go to the output, while otherwise it's one clock cycle. But you get three times more work done. Okay, so that's pipelining. Now pipelining works also, it's also a form of concurrency, but it's a different one than parallelism. Okay, so go back here. So let's look at a pipeline. So instead of using this F1 and F2, Oops, let's go back here. Next slide. Forward, forward. Okay, so you have your pipeline structure. So let's compare it with your original one. As you can see, the pipeline, your clock frequency doesn't change, right? We have the same frequency. We haven't changed the clock frequency because I want to get a sample out there every, I want to get the same throughput happening, right? I have to maintain that. My capacitance goes up. Now the switching capacitance per clock cycle is gonna go up because I have extra registers, extra clock load, so we're gonna have some overhead. My, so again, you look at the two, the product is approximately constant, actually it goes up a little bit. Till you come to the realization, hey, wait a second. Instead of having, uh, having to do two additions in a row in one clock period, I have to do only one addition or one function F in a clock period. I chopped up my critical part into pieces, which means I can run it slower, which means I can reduce the supply voltage. So pipelining allows you again to reduce the pipeline voltage with the factor epsilon pipe. And again, that's quadratic because it's VDD squared. So your power is one over the overhead plus the overhead plus the reduction in supply voltage of your pipeline. And again, you put all the numbers together and you see that you put a parallelism of two, you get a factor of two changes, you get a four, you get about a factor of four change. So both pipelining and parallelism, concurrency, are very powerful mechanisms to basically increase power while maintaining performance. Okay? And um, as I already mentioned, yes, it's cool, but I remember at some point in time, the beginning, the first amount of parallelism introduced, great, you get some, you do four, you get a little bit more, and then it flattens out because of the overhead. And if you're not careful, it goes up again. So you never want to go there. So, very important argument. Basically, this is why we all do know multi-core processors. But there's one thing that people f often forget. Everybody's basically raving about what's going to do next generation round to get power down. Oh, we're going to put more concurrency in there. That's the buzzword of the industry, right? Oh, now we're gonna use quad core, eight cores, 12 cores, whatever. There's one thing they forget very often when they make this statement. This thing only works if the following condition is true. What is the condition that has to be true to make this thing work? 
What's the key ID behind the concurrency part? You have stuff to be done in parallel. That's good. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I, I buy that. There might, there might be algorithms that are very sequential. There's no parallelism. Those. But a lot of the algorithms can be turned around and you can make them parallel. Like for instance, things like Google searches, they call them embarrassingly parallel. <laughs> There's so much parallelism in there that you want to do a large search, let's say you go to Google, you search, those things can be easily spread out over thousands of machines. So, but you're right. And for some applications, you might have some concurrency, but then at the end, you always run into that, I have to do this first before I have to do that, right? You're right. There's another one. Sorry? Control structure. Overhead might be an issue. But it's, actually it goes to the whole core of the concurrency. Why does concurrency help to reduce power? In principle, it doesn't help anything, right? If I put four processors down and I clock them four times slower, I get four more, I get a bigger chip, but it doesn't do anything. If I keep the supply voltage constant, it doesn't help me anything, right? I just make a bigger chip. You have to keep on scaling supply voltage. If you don't scale the supply voltage, if you don't turn the gain you get from the concurrency into a reduced supply voltage, you don't gain anything. It's just a bigger chip that leaks more. <laughs> so it hurts in the end if you're not careful. So it is very dependent upon a continued scaling of the supply voltage. That I basically keep on pushing that supply voltage lower and lower and lower. But remember what I just said early in the beginning of the lecture, that leakage factor starts to become a game. That the fact is if we get closer and closer to the threshold voltage, we have to find means to manage leakage. Otherwise, it then doesn't work. So that's, remember that. If you hear about people say, oh, concurrency is all the kind of rage of things, uh, it's, it's limited in its impact if I don't basically reduce it in energy per operation scaling. Um, but there's another factor, and the factor you mentioned really right now is, is, is uh, if you asked, um, if you looked about, I would say, five to ten years, five years back, companies like Intel would predict that by now we would have 16 core processors, 32 cores on a die. In reality, most of the stuff you have maybe is quad cores, eight cores. That's the typical number. The main reason for that is they haven't figured out how to do the software to basically take any application and map it effectively on your 20 cores or your 30 cores or whatever it is. And it's kind of a waste, right? If I put 32 cores down and my software only uses four of them, that's kind of a, sh a shame. It's a sad thing. So you can do more parallel functions, but it's a hard thing. So basically the software is another impediment, obviously, to basically getting more and more cores on the die. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. So this is saturation, this is your local leakage overhead. So remember this. I think this is a key message here. It only works when you reduce the supply voltage and you reduce VTH as well, but then you have to consider leakage. So this is kind of what an interesting thing is that um, if you think about concurrency, as I mentioned, what you do with concurrency is manipulate energy delay curves. Right? Suppose I have a certain function, okay, and this is the blue curve. I have my energy delay curve without concurrency. Let's say I want to do floating point multiplication. Let's take a very simple example. This is floating point multiplication. I plot out the energy delay curve and I get a certain point. I say, okay, for a given throughput, this is the energy. Let's say this is the throughput I want to get. This is the energy that I'm going to need. Now, I can do the same thing. I say I put two floating point units down. And for that flo two floating point units, I can again plot the energy delay curve, the red curve. And you can see something like this. Um, so we see that um, if I now look for the same throughput, my energy goes down substantially because of that voltage scaling. Right? So it shows that two processes is better than one for that particular thing. Now, be aware from the minimum energy perspective, if I really want to go minimum, minimum energy, I don't care about performance, actually the one processor version is going to be better. Because from the time I have two processors, I'm going to have a multiplexer or some overhead. 
it's going to cost me energy. So in this area here, minimum, absolute minimum energy, this region here, actually the one processor is unbeatable. Because from the time you put two, you have more concurrency, but you get better performance. And I can keep on doing that in three, four, five, and then you can start seeing slowly but surely uh, you might get better, but become very incrementally so. If I look at my energy uh, for this performance level, with two I'm getting here, with three I get a little bit better, with five I'm only marginally better. I'm multiplying my area with a factor of five, and I get only a very, very small increase in performance anymore for the same thing. But again, by doing this energy delay plots, I can start seeing conceptually what is the right solution given the amount of performance I want to get or the energy number I want to meet. Now, this shows something even more interesting. If I look at this curve, it says, what would happen, what should I do if I go slower than this? Suppose I, my, my application is something that is one of those neural processors. My neurons don't, don't fire very often. Um, they're basically about 10 kilohertz type of thingies. Any processor that I put behind there that would be gigahertz would be way overkill. So if my performance has to be, let's say I want to build a processor that runs at 20 kilohertz or has a performance at 20 kilohertz. So I look at my hardware and say, gee, if I use only one block, very dedicated, I'm going to be here. So what would be the right approach if I want to basically, what's going to give me the minimum energy if I want to go slower than that? What do you think? Yeah, that's an option. That's the discrete choices, right? And I think that's a good one. You're right, and I buy that. Um, it is already clear nowadays that people have done this already. If you look at microprocessors, think about what they did to get performance up in the high clock frequency regime times. They did all kind of bizarre things in the processor to make it gain some performance, like branch prediction. You got to predict in advance what, what direction a branch is going to go and you take it and then you figure out you're wrong. You basically, so a whole bunch of things we did. You made very complex processors. One of the big gains to going to concurrent processors, if you look at the processors that people use today, these multi-cores, they're a lot simpler. So forget about all those complicated things. There's extra hardware, it consumes more power, more energy. So let's use more simple processors. So that's a good one. But let's assume that I use the same block. Slow the clock is one thing, but that gives you a, um, let's assume that you have leakage, that would not be very good either, right? Because now your leakage factor will become dominant, more and more dominant when you go slower and slower in the clock. Yes? Earlier in the semester you said you can actually get an inverter work if you make the supply voltage below the threshold, right? Yeah, yeah, but, that, but again, at some point in time, you have to be careful, right? You, you can, there's an optimum energy point. I buy that, but you go below that, your energy will go up again because of leakage again. It's all about leakage. If you go too slow, leakage becomes the dominant factor. So what I do here in this direction is um, what I'm doing with concurrency is I put more and more hardware blocks around to work concurrently. I, I get performance by, but I want to get the opposite. I want to get the opposite of performance. What could I do? No, 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 it's in the right direction. It's the right direction. Now what I can do is go back to the old approach. Here I basically, let's say I want to do for multi flowing mul multiplies. Right? It's very simple, I have a stream of data and I have a multiplier. Right? With the concurrencies, I'm gonna put more of those things in parallel and then I feed one here and one here and one here. Right? What the opposite I could do is, is Instead of basically providing concurrency, I'm starting to reuse the same hardware. You go to more and more of a processor model. You actually start multiplexing 
multiple streams on the same hardware. So instead of going concurrency, you go, the inverse of concurrency is I take the same block and use it to do different functions. So I keep it busy. So multiplexing, you start actually building a multiplexing type of strategy. This is shown right here. So suppose I have two streams doing the same thing. Rather than having each of them having their dedicated block, now it's going to say I'm going to use one block and I have one stream using it and then the other stream using it. It's just the opposite of concurrency. It's multiplexing multiple tasks on a function. So what it basically says is that this whole concept of a instruction-based machine is really good if you will go really slow then it becomes a more energy effective solution because I take one hardware block and I keep it busy all the time. I try to keep it busy as much as possible. And if I don't have enough data, let's see if I can find some other stuff to put on it so that I keep it busy. So that's an interesting observation. Uh, if the throughput is below the optimum of that particular block, what you try to use is that block you use it more often with other type of functions to observe it. So, and uh, actually, your clock frequency might go up again. It's kind of bizarre. Right? It's, uh, rather than keep on reducing the clock frequency, leakage should become bigger and bigger. Now say, I'm going to keep my, I'm going to make sure that my hardware keeps doing a basic job. And at the optimum energy point. So just an interesting thought process here. So that's where I'll keep it for today. Um, I think this is important that you realize concurrency, what it does, how it plays with supply voltage scaling. Uh, next lecture, I'm going to talk a bit about Posters, number one. Number two, we're going to talk about uh, some perspectives. And number three, I would like to say a couple more words about leakage because I haven't said very much about this and what people do to combat leakage. It's an important factor. And it's a, I think it's important that you kind of realize a little bit, what, if I have a circuit that's leaking a lot, what can I do? How can I get around that? Okay? So I'll see you on Friday. And by then we'll have also probably a first glance at phase two of the project.